Hi students, I wanted to talk to you this evening about introductory paragraphs for your argument essay and some different strategies that you can use to try to engage your readers and also familiarize them with your issues. So um, one of the handouts that I've included in our resources is this one where it lists a few different ways to organize your paper and these will really depend upon your audience that you choose and how you want to approach your audience. So if your audience is, you know, against your thesis or against your approach, your stance, then a Rogerian strategy might be the best um, or a delayed thesis might be the best. And in this method of organization, your thesis will not be until the end of your paper. However, if you're dealing with an audience that perhaps is just not strongly against you or strongly for you, uh, maybe unaware or uninformed, then a classical strategy might be best. And this is what we might think of more as kind of the typical essay where our claim or thesis is somewhere in the introduction. So really how you organize the introduction, all of them are going to have some kind of hook or engaging piece to them. And some of them are going to, and most of them are going to describe the context or the situation um, of your debate but whether or not they contain the thesis is really going to depend upon your audience. So that's going to be one of the crucial differing factors. So what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about um, some ways in the classical method to begin your introduction and then I'm going to show you a few different sample student essays that I have and talk about what I think that they've done really well in their introductions that you might want to try to emulate or at least consider. So your introduction, you may be used to think of a, thinking of an introduction of your essay as being one paragraph, but because this essay is a little bit longer, you know, and we're trying to break free of the five paragraph FCAP mentality, you can think of your introduction as really being one to two paragraphs. And the first paragraph might center around more of the hook, the engagement of your reader, and perhaps introducing the context of your argument, whereas the second paragraph might deal more with um, explaining key terms or giving the background of your issue, something like that. So for instance here I talk about how there are different strategies to hook your reader and this might be um, explaining your reason or your occasion for writing. Now I know your occasion for writing is because I'm making you because you're assigned a paper and you have to write but if we're playing in the world of let's pretend why people usually write arguments is because they're called to them for some reason. Maybe there's something that they've observed in the argument. They've been drawn into the argument because they've heard someone say something or write something and they want to respond to it. So that might be a reason for writing. Or um, they just feel moved because they have a connection to the issue. So um, I've had students before who, you know, maybe they have a grandparent who is suffering from a terminal disease, whether it's cancer or Alzheimer's or something like that. And so this has drawn them to consider the idea of euthanasia and its legality and morality. And so that's what's called them to write. So whatever your reason is, whether it's personal or public, um, that might be one way to begin your essay and to start explaining from that perspective. You can also tell a story. As an English teacher, of course, I love stories. But, um, and this, again, could be from your research, more public of a story, or this could be a personal story. So uh, those students who were writing about euthanasia and some of them have chosen to introduce their essay by telling a story where, you know, they had to deal with a grandparent who was really in severe pain and pain management techniques weren't working and they had a terminal diagnosis and, you know, their family was really contemplating, 
you know, should euthanasia be an option for us? Or I had a student who, um, the idea of whether the death penalty should be legal, this was very personal for her because she had, um, had her mom and aunt had been murdered. And so she was caught up in even the trial afterwards because she was a witness for whether or not the death penalty should be uh, used in the case against the the killer. And, you know, that's definitely an extreme story. I hope you don't have stories like those, those to share. But I'm just saying if you do, and again, they don't have to be that extreme. They might be about, you know, social networking or something like that. But that those personal stories can be very engaging if they highlight a key aspect of the debate. So if you don't have one of those, you, usually some of your stories do have that experiential element. I mean, some of your sources, your research, usually there is... Um, an experiential or an anecdotal example that you might be able to pull from there and cite in your introduction. Um, describing the situation, and really what that means is kind of describing the debate. So if we're talking about something like, I'm just thinking my, um, I heard on the news today, you know, they were one of the things, one of the many things they were talking about was the idea of NFL players kneeling for the anthem um, before a game. And so one of the people I was watching it with was like, you know, they hadn't been following the debate and they said, what is this all about? And the news anchor was trying to ground the debate for them, was trying to say, well, you know, there is one side that believes that this is a valid and strong and good way to protest the treatment of people of color in America and there is another side that believes this is not a good way to express your First Amendment rights and to express your protest over the condition of people of color in America. And so he was trying to explain both sides before he introduced you know, the people who are going to be arguing about it on his news show. Explain a key controversial term. So, again, define using a definition to start your essay is perfectly acceptable, but try not to pick a term that everyone actually understands because there's no point in defining something that everybody knows. <clears throat> For instance, you know, if you have a debate like illegal immigration. I don't know that we need to, well, that's probably not a good one because we could define that actually. We could define what it means to be an American or what it means to be illegal. Those are things that are debated within that issue. Excuse me while I take a sip of water here. My voice is going. But you could explain a key controversial term and then explore that to segue into your issue. But you wouldn't want to explain something like, I mean, if we were trying to talk about whether or not social networking negatively affects uh, people's relationships or communication, I don't know that we'd want to define social networking or define communication or define relationships. Those are pretty basic terms that I think we can all agree on. Use an analogy. So remember, an analogy is a comparison between two things or an elongated comparison. A short comparison might just be a metaphor, but an analogy is a type of a metaphor where things are compared um, in detail and in quite a few sentences. So, you know, for instance, if you're having something like um, your research question revolves around um, legalizing medical marijuana. Maybe you want to compare that to legalizing, um, I'm trying to think of something else that was helpful to society but controversial, and I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But, you know, if you had a comparison going on there, that might be useful. Explain the history of the issue. That's a viable way to start, but just know that if you do it in your introduction, you aren't going to repeat the same data in part two. You know, you might go into different history of the issue, but you don't want to go into the same stuff. And then um, 
finally, visualize a situation real or imagine. Use a key quotation to explain what you think it means to your issue. So this could be just giving an everyday situation where your readers might come into contact with your debatable issue. So people often ask about how much pathos to use. Generally, you want to use pathos sparingly in an academic es essay um, because we rely more on logos and ethos. But if you are going to use pathos, that the introduction and conclusion are good places to use it because this is where you draw your readers in and, um, and try to form bonds with them. And so then I talk a little bit about some examples there. So I'm going to shelve that for now and I want to show you a couple of examples before my voice gives out here. Oh my goodness. So this is one you can see I, I actually have this. This is one that was graded and this student's question was um, should paid maternity leave be required in the United States? So I'm going to read you just probably her first paragraph um, and then talk to you about what I like about it, even though I consider her introduction her first and second. The United States, Swaziland, and Papua New Guinea are in a class by themselves. It's hard to imagine what these three countries could have in common to the exclusion of all other developed nations in the world. The answer is simple. Paid maternity leave for new mothers. Every other developed country in the world protects the ability of working mothers to have a period of time off from their jobs with at least some portion of their income after the birth of a child. With America's position as a leader in human rights protection around the world, the United States' failure to ensure the rights of women to be protected from financial distress during the months surrounding childbirth is shocking. Paid maternity leave would benefit American families and businesses alike and should be a mandatory benefit for employees. So here we do have an introduction with a clear thesis emerging. So if her research question is, should paternity leave, paid maternity leave be required? You know, she is arguing that, yes, it, you know, should be a mandatory benefit for employees. So we see a clear... Um, stance there and the reasoning is that it would benefit American families and businesses alike so that's her support for her stance and you want to try to have both those elements in your thesis. Now the way she starts is with a little bit of a background of the issue so she, she kind of begins it I think pretty interestingly by talking about you know three countries that you would not ordinarily put together the United States Swaziland and Papua New Guinea I mean I don't know much about Papua New Guinea or Swaziland but when I picture them I believe they're in Africa I believe they're kind of third world countries or smaller countries at the very least so I don't think about them being on par with the United States so I guess because she includes them, she says they're a developed nation, so I shouldn't say they're a third world country, but they seem smaller and less developed than certainly the United States, which seems a forerunner when we talk about modernization and civil rights issues and just being very um, progressive. But so when they say these countries are the three of the of the few developed nations in the world that do not have paid maternity leave for new mothers, that's kind of a surprising statement. So beginning with a surprising statement is a great way to start as well. And then she goes into the background of the issue and her kind of premise um, or assumption, one of her key assumptions, is that you know, America specifically is a leader in human rights protection and so that's why we should head this or spearhead. Um, I shouldn't say spearhead because all the other countries have done it before us, but that we should really be on par with them as far as giving paid maternity leave. And then the second paragraph really just gives you, and you can pause this on your own, is to, um, it looks over the history of what the current laws are. So what is the current situation in your debate? What are the, 
Is there any legislature that is being proposed? Are there any rule changes that people are talking about right now? Um, this can be a good place to kind of give the latest update on your issue. Um, so this is a, one of those more personal essays where she used um, a personal story in the introduction and this was a student of mine who um, her family dealt with this idea of victim impact statements and all I'm going to tell you is that these are statements that sometimes the court allows people to submit in, um, in a trial to before they consider the verdict and sometimes they don't allow them to submit these statements. So her research question was something like, should victim impact statements be allowed or be considered as part of a verdict? So she says, victim in impact statements, the big picture. You may be more familiar with victim impact statements if you're a member of the club. That is, the club of compromised individuals and families who have either been victims of crime or have lost loved ones as a result of a crime. I was unwillingly initiated into this club on December 2, 2007, when my stepson was killed as a result of an alcohol-related car crash. The driver, later referred to as Driver John Doe, was arrested for DUI manslaughter and is currently out on bond awaiting trial. If he is found guilty, my family and I will have the opportunity to present victim impact statements for the court for consideration at his sentencing hearing. Victim impact statements are statements prepared by victims and or their families to be submitted to the court, either in writing or verbally, to illustrate the effect of defendants' actions have had on their lives. While the use of victim impact statements, also referred to as victim impact evidence or victim impact testimony, may seem like a fairly simple concept, research on the topic reveals controversy surrounding their use. So here she's describing the situation and she's also defining the key term of victim impact statements and what it is because she's assuming her audience may not be familiar with it. And so you see here, again, she kind of gives a brief history in the second paragraph where she talks about where they kind of first started and became an issue. So, you know, we don't need to go back to the very inception of your issue, but when was the last big milestone in your issue? When did things get rather heated? And what was that milestone about bringing us up to the current time? That might be a thing to concentrate on in the second paragraph. And I'm just giving you a, you know, kind of top to bottom view here. So if you want to pause this video and read this, you can. And I'm going to do the same thing with, um, let's see, which one is this? With this um, essay, I'm not going to read it one, because my voice is giving two, because this video is getting long, but I will pause it here, or you can pause it here if you want to read this um, this introduction. But this is an example of someone using kind of an everyday example or visualization where readers might be familiar with their topic and um, and also then going into a brief history of the issue. So you want to make sure to have that hook. You want to make sure to have any necessary background information. But remember, when we talk about, um, oh, here it is. When we talk about the thesis organization, that if you're dealing with something that is like um, the Rogerian method or the delayed thesis, that you may not actually have your thesis statement in the introduction. It may appear later in the paper. So that's worthy of noting. All right. Well, I hope that helps as far as strategies for crafting introductions. And I will give you some feedback as we go along.